Hello, and welcome to Healthy Living Together. Healthy Living Together is a partnership in Sanilac County between McKenzie Health System, Michigan State University Extension, the Sanilac County Health Department, and the Sanilac County Community Mental Health. Today, our topic is on calming anxiety through mindfulness. Our speaker is Jackie Rabine. She is a health educator for Michigan State University Extension. Um, today, she's going to be speaking a little bit. We are pre-recording this, so unfortunately, you won't have a chance to ask questions today. Um, if I come up with some good ones, I will ask them on your behalf at the end. And um, Jackie will do her best to give you an insight into this very broad topic that um, cannot possibly cover, be covered in this brief amount of time. Uh, this recording, uh, you should be able to access. It should be emailed to you. And we will see that we can include Jackie's contact information in case you would like to learn more about this topic later on. So with that, I am going to um, stop sharing this and let Jackie bring her PowerPoint up. And I would like to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Jackie Rabine. All right, thank you so much, Carol. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint up here. So just uh, bear with me for one second here and then we will be ready to go. Get my slideshow showing. And there we go. So this uh, program is a part of the Health and Nutrition Institute's uh, Mindfulness for Better Living series. And uh, what we're specifically going to talk about today is some brief practices in mindfulness. And we'll, as we go through, we'll talk a little bit about mindfulness and anxiety and depression. And um, this, this was the broadest way that we could introduce this subject to you. Now, as, as we kind of um, talk about these things, know that we are really just dipping our toe into the surface of mindfulness. Um, MSU Extension does a lot of more in-depth programs for mindfulness. So if you are interested, my contact information is in my PowerPoint and you are welcome to contact me in, you know, at any time and, and get more information about certain subjects. Hopefully Carol will come up with some good questions too, but we'll, we'll go with that. Um, so welcome. I'm glad that you're here. And um because we are MSU and this is one of our core values is inclusion, um, I do want to read you our affirmative action statement today. So MSU is an affirmative action equal opportunity employer. Michigan State University Extension programs and materials are open to all without regard to race, color, national origin, sex, gender, gender identity, religion, age, height, weight, disability, political beliefs, sexual orientation, marital status, family status, or veteran status. All right, and moving on, here is my contact information. So um, you are welcome to contact me as I mentioned at any time. All right, so our objectives today are to understand um, mindfulness at its most basic level. We will experience several different mindfulness practices. And then hopefully as you move on out of here, you'll be able to put at least one of these into practice in your life and see what a difference it really can make. All right, so I want you to think first, just for a couple of minutes or just a couple seconds here, what does mindfulness mean to you? So we all have some thoughts about what mindfulness might be or how we feel that we are being mindful in our lives, but we don't always necessarily, we know that feeling. Most people really know that feeling when they're being mindful. 
but they don't always associate it with, oh, I do have a mindful practice. And hopefully, again, that's another thing that you'll get out of today is you will understand, oh yeah, when I do that, I am being mindful and I should do more of it. All right, so uh, according to um, Dr. Dan Siegel, one definition of mindfulness is in its most general sense is it's waking up from that automatic life um, and being sensitive to the novelty in our everyday experiences. And what that really means is, and, and how we experience that is we live a large part of our life on automatic. We do the same things kind of on a kind of daily or weekly basis. And so we just kind of do that automatically, right? I wake up, I have my coffee, I get ready for work, and I do these things without really thinking about what I'm doing. It's just automatic to me. Mindfulness is waking up from that automatic and being really aware of what we're doing as we're doing it. Okay. All right. So how do we do that? Here is what we consider and, and many um, um, people use this as really the, the basic definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is paying attention to what? And that's that's what beginners to mindfulness always say. Well, what am I paying attention to? It can be one of many, many things. It can be our breathing. It can be the sensations of eating. It can be actually paying attention to our thoughts, um, the sensory stuff that's going on around us, right? So it's paying attention on purpose. And I always say on purpose, getting ahead of stress, right? So we all know that we need to do something mindful once that stress bus has knocked us down. But being mindful in our lives is getting ahead of that stress bus, knowing that this is something we can build in that builds resilience to stress so that, that when that stress bus comes along, it's not going to knock us down, okay? So on purpose, building it into our lives, getting into the present moment. How do we get into the present moment? By being aware of what's coming in through our senses. So what do I see? What do I hear? What can I touch? What can I taste? And what can I smell, right? It's really connecting with those five senses. And then with a non-judgmental attitude. We human beings like to put a label on everything. So it's good, it's bad, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, it's too sunny. We put a label on everything as opposed to it just is. And we find that when we are less judgmental, it becomes much easier to put the things that are happening to us in perspective. Because if we think about it, everything in our life is pretty fleeting. And part of that mindfulness and that non-judgment allows us to kind of put things in perspective. When they're really good, it's not going to last forever. And when they're really bad, it's not going to last forever, which allows us to find much more balance, right? Okay, so moving along from there, because that was a lot, right? That's, that's the technical part of it. The more fun part of it comes along now. All right, so the one thing that we can most easily use to tune into our mindfulness is breathing. We all do it. It's with us all the time. And if... 
if you're not breathing, then you've got bigger problems than mindfulness is going to fix. And so I always say, you can tap into this anywhere at any time, no matter how much stress you have going on in your life. You can just turn your focus to your breath. And mindful attention to our breath has been shown to help regulate our emotions and reduce that stress. It helps us to calm down. It helps us to slow our breathing, even without thinking about it, and to slow our heart rate and lower our blood pressure. All right, so we're going to give this a try. So I'd like to introduce you to four square breathing. And so just settle yourself for a minute. If you're standing, go ahead and sit down and just kind of settle into your chair. But sit up nice and straight so that you can get a good breath in. And what you're gonna do is inhale through your nose for four seconds. Hold that breath for about four seconds and then exhale through your nose or your mouth for four seconds. Hold with no breath for four seconds, and then repeat that. We'll go a couple rounds. So I'm gonna say inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold two, three, four. We're going to repeat. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. And hold, two, three, four. All right. And rather than have you repeat that, um, I'd like you to think, how did that feel for you? Was that easy? Uh, sometimes this one can be a little bit challenging because we are affecting, maybe taking ourselves off our natural rhythm of breathing. And so I do encourage you, there are many um, breathing exercises out there on YouTube or um, different places that can help you if you're, if this breathing pattern isn't really helpful for you. Um, but we do find that um, four square breathing does help to regulate, especially if you're, you're taking those very shallow um, rapid breaths that this will get you back into. Um, a good rhythm. So, all right. So another breathing exercise that I have for you is what we call a uh, star breathing. And this one's really good. It, it um, works really well if you have children or, you know, possibly work with children, but it also helps to calm us as, as adults. So what we're going to do is put one hand up and I'll, I'll do it. You don't have to do it. Um, and we're just going to start at the wrist and we're going to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. All right. And then you can go ahead, swing back around and start again. Um, star breathing is wonderful, as I said, with children. And if we are with children who are dysregulated, it definitely helps to have that adult trace the hand with them because then you're co-regulating with that um, sense of touch also. So um, again, 
that one's that one's really easy for kids to understand. It's really easy for kids to visualize, right? They can also you, you can trace with a pen too if they are not feeling somebody else's touch, which sometimes dysregulated kids don't want to be touched. But they can they can trace their hand with a pen on a piece of paper, and it works quite nicely. All right, so benefits of practicing mindfulness because there are so many. Um, the benefits of practicing mindfulness, um, it, it improves our ability to focus and maintain focus. So um, when people begin practicing mindfulness, they often say, well, my mind won't stay, my attention won't stay on my breathing for that long. I, you know, I'm okay for, for a couple of breaths and then my mind wanders off. And what we say is nobody becomes an expert at mindfulness immediately. Um, and so your mind will wander off. Just notice where it went and bring it back. Hey, come on back. I'm supposed to be paying attention to my breathing. And again, It'll stay there for 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, and then it will wander off again. And every time that it wanders off and we notice it and we bring it back, I'm paying attention to my breathing right now. What we're doing is actually strengthening the neural pathways that allow us to maintain our focus, to maintain memory. Um, and so it improves our memory. It improves that ability to focus. Mindfulness, when practiced um, regularly, it, it boosts our immunity. It helps to improve our relationships. We become better at self-awareness. And when we have better self-awareness, we are more able to relate well to others. Um, it increases self-esteem and self-compassion. Kindness to ourselves is also important. Um, and then it helps us with regulation of emotions. So additionally, mindfulness helps with reducing anxiety, depression, and stress. And it decreases anger and hostility. Um, reduces physical and emotional pain and helps people who deal with insomnia. Um, this is always something I bring up in, in the first of my classes is that when you wake up at 2 a.m. and you have those 2 a.m. thoughts and your mind just won't shut off, a fantastic way to get started with mindfulness is to focus on your breathing when your mind won't calm down in the middle of the night. Focus on my breathing. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. And pretty soon you find that your breathing has slowed and your mind has kind of started to feel sleepy again. And most people usually drift off within a few minutes. So mindfulness is a promising practice for improving both physical and emotional health. Um, it does take practice though. You're not gonna do this once or twice and it's going to change the way your brain works. But 50 years of research plus have shown that mindfulness as a practice does actually help with physical and emotional health. All right, so let me move along here. Within the field of mindfulness, grounding refers to the ability to return to that present moment with sustained attention. And that sustained attention is what I talked about when I said your mind will wander off. It's not sustaining attention. Practicing mindfulness regularly helps to grow that sustained attention. Sometimes it's really difficult to stay focused. Um, grounding is one technique that may help you to stay in the moment and focus. So some therapists use this technique to help people dealing with extreme stress and trauma. Um, grounding helps for focused attention um, in meditation practices while paying attention to a particular object, such as possibly a, a rock or a stone, or really it can be anything, but the weight 
of a stone is really nice for this practice. So I'm going to lead you through a mindful grounding experience using an object such as a stone, a pen, a stress ball, anything that you have in your immediate area will work. Um, so you don't need anything special for this uh, technique. In fact, I am, I brought my pen today. I did not bring a rock. Um, and we're going to go ahead and practice this. All right. So mindful grounding. I invite you to find an object, something small, something that you could hold in your hand, possibly the palm of your hand, and take a moment to shift your awareness to your object, allowing everything else in your mind to pause. The only thing that you need to focus on for this minute is that object. Take a look at it. Notice the shape, the size, the colors. Does it have curves or edges? Notice the light, the shadows, the surface. Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it shiny? Is it dull? Now allow yourself to feel the object. Use your fingers to explore the surface that you observed. Does it feel like you expected? What is the texture, the weight of the object? Notice any features that make the surface interesting. If you wish, I invite you to close your eyes because sometimes that can heighten that sense of touch. How does it feel in your hand? Is it warm? Is it cool? Smooth? Rough? Comfortable? Or does it feel strange in your hand? Is it calming to hold? Does it feel like something you'd like to rub your thumb on? Allow yourself to just focus on this object. Anchor yourself to the object. Breathing and noticing. Breathing and experiencing. Notice how it feels in this moment. Notice the sensations, the physical sensations of it, and then notice any emotions that are around. Remember, you can take this object with you and come back to noticing any time that you want to. Or you can find a different object and give it the same focus. We can notice anything in our environment in this way. All right. Okay. So, again, a different way of noticing things that we may run across every day. I look at my pen every day. I don't look at it in that way every day. I don't notice how much it weighs in my hands, any of those things. And here I am, I have connected most all of my senses to this. And what happened when I did? What happened in my brain and my body was that I started to slow my heart rate. I started to lower my blood pressure. I started to deepen and slow my breathing without even thinking about it right? All of these physical effects happened because my attention was on something else and my stress started to kind of come down out of my body. All right. So how does mindfulness work? That is the big question. 
Um, so it took researchers until the mid 1980s, about the time when we developed all of those huge tests like MRIs, PET scans and EEGs, and all of those became much more commonplace. And what they figured out is that brains are able to change. They're able to adapt. They can do this because of a trait called neuroplasticity. It's the ability of the brain to change, right? It's, it's all of our neurons in our brain are able to be turned on, turned off, make different connections. And that allows our brain to adapt to different things. So neuroplasticity is that physiological change in the brain that happens as we interact in different ways with our environment. Practicing mindfulness increases something called cortical thickness. And it means it lights up the hippocampus which is the part of the brain that is responsible for learning and for memory. Mindfulness also increases electrical activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is this part back here, and increases, and increases blood flow, which allows us to think more clearly. And um, that helps us to turn on when we are stressed or, or continue to keep on our prefrontal cortex, which is that reasoning, logical, figure it out part of our brain. It's the adult part of our brain. And so it's often the part that kind of goes offline when we are stressed. So the more we can keep that going, the better. Um, all right, so how to quiet our mind. Um, our minds are in constant motion. Um, we, we are constantly reading off that laundry list of things that we need to get done. Um, we list our fears, both real and imaginary. Um, we recall hurt things that have happened in the past. We like to play them over and over again with that what if, what if, what if. And what that can lead us to is what we call depressive rumination. And it is that replaying of bad things or things that have not gone particularly well for us. And it continues to kind of dig us into this pit where we are, we are not well, we're not happy with what's going on. Um, we like to, our brain likes to constantly judge the present. And I kind of talked about that. And then um, our brain is really good at, at uh, creating catastrophic what if situations, right? We go into some um, environment and our brain says, well, you know, what if, what if this happens and what if that happens? And it always comes up with that worst case scenario, right? It never comes up with the best case scenario. So because of that constant inner noise, that chatter, um, it's really hard for us to slow down and enjoy the present because we're constantly thinking about what could have been or what was. So all that negativity tends to affect our mood. It makes us unhappy, angry, restless, anxious, and it interferes with our concentration. It has a negative impact on our behavior and it affects our ability to have positive interactions with others. In other words, it adds, our brain adds to the stress that is already in our lives. The good news is there's ways to kind of calm this, this down and um, calm it down and get back into the present. Think about what's happening right now. Help you sleep better and make you healthier and happier. So here are some ways that um, can, help, can help to calm that chattering mind. The first is to know that your anxious mind can be calmed. You, you don't actually have to let it run. You can rein it in. Come on, it's okay. We don't have to worry about that. You can talk to your mind. Your brain is this amazing, amazing um, organ. 
but it also believes things that it tells itself. And so if you're telling it, it's okay, we can make this, it will start to believe you. All right, so talk to your anxious mind. Why is it upset? Why, why am I thinking this? Why is this going on? We can start making lists, right? At 2 a.m., that's when everybody thinks of everything that they need to get done in this world. We can talk to it and we can work our way around it. We can bring a pad of paper and set it there and say, okay, I've written it down now. I can go back to sleep. And it works, right? Um, or conduct that. If your brain is going worst case scenario, worst case scenario, really lean into that for a minute and write down or think through all the worst case things that could happen and then think through a plan for them. And once you've got a plan, your brain will calm itself down. All right, engage your mind. Um, give it something important to do, something that really draws you in. So if you're a reader who can fall into a book and look up and it's an hour later, then maybe that's what your brain needs right now. Maybe it needs to go out to the garden and dig in the garden. Maybe it needs to go running or do some exercise. Engage the mind in something that it really engages in where you don't think about anything else, right? Play a game of fives. Uh, the game of fives is simple. It's another grounding technique and five things I can see four things I can hear, three things I can touch, two things I can taste or smell, one or the other, and then one thing that I can either taste or smell, the other one, right? And, you know, that can be as simple as popping a mint in your mouth. It can be as simple as sticking your head out the door and smelling the rain today, or the, the snow, or the fall leaves, or the summer flowers it's just connecting and when we say touch things just feeling a flat cool tabletop can be enough to kind of bring that calm into you okay so play a game of fives and then pico brief pico breathing pico is it's actually um from the from an ancient hawaiian kuna philosophy pico means uh, navel or center. And the technique involves breathing in deeply. And as you do, focusing your attention on the top of your head. And then as you exhale deeply, focus your attention on your navel or your belly button. So almost feel that breath coming in through your head as you Extend through your body. So breathe in and breathe out with your attention on your navel. And what you're doing there is giving your brain a need to change its attention. So I'm going from here to here, here to here, here to here. And sometimes that's easier than, than actually just paying attention to the breath coming in and out because it's moving around, it's giving the brain a more specific task to do. And that can be helpful for quieting that brain. All right, so mindfulness begins with us. We've tried two breathing practices. We've tried a grounding practice, and we've tried a couple of ways to calm your mind. Now let's talk about how mindfulness can help us deal with everyday stress. First, we'll talk about stress and its effects on you. We'll discuss some typical stress cues and how to help you recognize the signals that your mind and body send out to let you know that you're experiencing stress. We'll demonstrate the use of a calming or cortisol jar to, to describe what stress does to your brain and body and how you can use it to calm down. And then we'll experience another practice, a brief body scan, and then we'll tune in to what's happening um, in your body at any kind of given moment. So what is stress? 
Stress is our response to a perceived threat or demand, either internal or external. It has effects on our bodies, minds, and emotions. Sometimes stress can motivate us to make positive changes. For example, you want a better job, so you decide to go back to school to be, to be qualified to get a different job. And sometimes um, stress is a positive thing such as we've all celebrated things, a holiday, having a baby, getting married. Those are inherently stressful situations, but they're also good stress, right? And then stress can, of course, be a negative thing. For example, if you had a car accident, you lost your job, or you got in trouble for something. Point is, stress is an individual, everyday experience. We cannot get rid of it completely but we can learn to recognize it and build skills to cope with it and its potential negative effects on our physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being. All right, so how does stress affect you physically? One of the most important steps is learning mindfulness. In learning mindfulness is to learn to recognize or notice our personal stress cues. Any stress cue, whether it's physical or an emotion, thought, behavior, can remind us that we need to move into a state of mindfulness. We're noticing in that non-judgmental, kind, and curious way. So what happens in your body when you get stressed? Where do you feel it in your body? A lot of times people feel it in their head, right? They develop a headache or that the tight muscles in your, in your neck, in your shoulders, that's a very frequent one, especially at work because we sit often in front of a computer. And so all of this tightens up. A lot of people experience stomach issues when they are stressed, um, tight, tight muscles through your, through your stomach or things just don't work the way that they're supposed to there. Um, all, all over body aches, um, feeling tired, clenching your jaw, gritting your teeth. Um, all of those are, are physical symptoms that are pretty, pretty frequent when we are stressed. And then emotionally, what do we feel often when we're stressed? Um, a lot of people feel um, overwhelmed. Um, they feel anxious. They can't concentrate. They have a hard time remembering tasks or facts. They can't fall asleep or they can't stay asleep, right? Um, I always say that I feel when I am stressed, like I'm on a hamster wheel and it's just one thing after another and another. And I feel like I'm running and running and running and running and nothing makes sense. Nothing gets done. Nothing gets, no thought gets completed. So that's, that's pretty normal emotional way of kind of handling things. Um, and then what behaviors do we uh, deal with? Um, a lot of people, when they are stressed, they are much more easily angered. So yelling, slamming doors, um, just feeling like they're very overwhelmed, um, avoiding people. This is a common um, stress reaction, uh, procrastinating, another stress reaction. Um, and then uh, we find, or we find research finds that when you are stressed, you are much more likely to get injured. You are much more likely to have small everyday home accidents, things like cutting yourself while you're cooking, um, slamming your fingers in the door, um, just silly bumping, bumping your toes when, you know, you, you just don't quite judge that couch right and you stub your toe on it. Um, all of those things are much more likely to happen when you are stressed because the grown up regulatory part of your brain isn't talking to the emotional part of your brain. And so there's a little disconnect going on there. You're also much more likely if you get in your car to have an auto accident because your brain is not paying as much attention 
to what it should be paying while you are stressed. So what does stress do to our brain? When we are stressed, there is a cascade of things that happen in our body. Because as I mentioned, stress is our body's um, response to feeling like we are, there's a threat. It's a perceived threat. That's what stress is. And so our body goes into fight or flight mode, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. And if there, our body does not sense a way, first of all, our body is looking for a way to escape from the stress. If it does not perceive a way to escape from the stress, it will gear up to fight the stress. And so it responds with it with a cascade of different physiological responses. So the first is the release of adrenaline and cortisol. We're going to talk about cortisol in just a second, but adrenaline. Adrenaline raises our heart rate. It raises our blood pressure. It gives us that sh kind of shaky feeling, right? I've got all this energy and I don't know where it's going yet because we may have to outrun the stress or we may have to fight that perceived threat. It shuts down our digestive system. It shuts down our immune system because if there's a threat to me, I don't have to worry about digesting my last meal, right? So my meal is just gonna sit there. That's why people often feel sick when they're stressed. It's going to try to, it's tightening up my blood vessels, which is going to try to keep most of my blood in my core because whatever this threat is, if it takes a bite out of me, I want to not bleed to death. So it's gonna to try to keep my core with most of my blood in it. That's often why we feel very hot and flushed and shaky while we are stressed. Um, it's often also why our hands feel tingly when we're stressed. It's because they're not getting really good blood flow that they're used to. All right. And then cortisol is the other hormone that is released when we are in that fight or flight response. Cortisol is a natural steroid hormone. So that steroid part of it helps to raise blood pressure and raise um, heart rate. It also um, manufactures the release of glucose into our blood because ready energy to fight or run away from this threat. But cortisol works primarily in our brain. And what it does is it muddies up the water between our prefrontal cortex, our rational adult part of our brain, and the lower emotional part of our brain that just says run or fight. And so we use this as a little example. So you can see my, I have a cortisol jar here and you can see it's pretty clear, dyed a little bit pink, but um, some of the color came off in glitter. Okay, and so when I am stressed, my, well, when I'm calm, my brain looks like this. It's pretty clear, clear thinking, right? When I am stressed, let's see if we can get stressed here. Okay, so you can see my stress here. This is my brain now. It's not functioning very well. It's really muddy. And that cortisol is really kind of, I can't see through anything through this anymore. And so that's my muddy brain now. All right. By the way, this is great if you have kids or you often get stressed. This is called a stress jar. And watching the glitter settle itself actually helps us to settle the cortisol and adrenaline in our body. So that release of the stress hormones, that fight or flight response, our body is made to be in that fight or flight response for about 20 minutes. Because by that point, we should either have outrun the stress or whatever the stressor is at that point, if we fought it, we either fought it off or we didn't. But either way, our brain is made to be starting to come back down to normal after about 20 minutes. However, in our lives nowadays, 
stress doesn't usually stick around for only 20 minutes. And so what we're running into is a lot of people who have ongoing stress, right? And that ongoing stress, that ongoing trigger of the fight or flight response leads to stress-related diseases. Heart disease is a stress-related disease. High blood pressure is a stress-related disease. And so that's that not being able to process our stress and having ongoing stress can, you know, it can affect our immune system on, on, on an ongoing basis. It can affect our heart on an ongoing basis. And so what we want is ways that you can start to bring down your uh, blood pressure, your heart rate, um, and to be able to handle your stress. Okay, so moving along here, we're going to try another. Um, technique to um, look at our stress. And this time we're going to try a brief body scan. And this one um, is by Dr. Robert Eric Denenberg. And um, it starts, oh, oh there it goes. Welcome to your meditation. Your I'm Dr. Robert Eric Denenberg, and I'll guide you through from start to finish. Mindfulness is present moment attention without judgment. For this meditation, we'll attend to our feet with mindfulness, and then we'll move on to the breath in the abdomen, and then to finish, we'll return to the feet. So let's get started. With mindfulness, start to observe your feet. Answer this question to yourself. What does it feel like to have my feet on the ground in this present moment? Explore this present moment experience of your feet. You might notice what it feels like to have your feet in your shoes, in your socks, you might observe different points of pressure presenting to different parts of your feet. And you might notice temperature. Simply observe whatever you notice. There's no right or wrong, no good or bad. Whatever you notice is okay. And anything that takes you away from this noticing is a distraction. Any thought about the future or the past, any worry or expectation, any internal dialogue or judgment, notice and let go with forgiveness, with patience, notice and let go, notice and let go and shepherd your attention back to your feet. And when you're ready, let go of your feet and shift your attention to your abdomen. Here we find the home base for mindfulness of breathing. Observe what it feels like to breathe in this present moment. Explore and discover your own way of noticing your own breath. You might observe a rising of your abdomen as you breathe in and a falling as you breathe out your own way of noticing your own breath might include registering an expanding feeling as you breathe in and a deflating feeling as you breathe out. Rest 
ride the waves of your breath with your attention. Anything that takes you away from your breath is a distraction. Any thought about the future or the past, any worry or internal dialogue, any expectation or judgment, notice and let go. Notice and let go. With forgiveness, notice and let go. And time and time again, shepherd your attention back to your breath. Back to answering this very simple question. What does it feel like to breathe in this present moment? And when you're ready to transition out of the meditation, return to your feet. This time there can be some movement in your toes. And notice what it feels like to be moving your toes in this present moment. And let this movement transition you out of the meditation. So as your fingers are moving and if you wish your body's stretching, you can transition fully out of the meditation. Thank you. All right. Hopefully you're feeling a little calmer. I That's one of my absolute favorite meditations um, is the body scan. So moving on, another way that um, we like to practice mindfulness is in mindful walking. And this for people particularly who um, have a hard time sitting still. So I'll tell you, this is my absolute favorite because uh, I don't sit still or very well, is mindful walking. And often we can sync up our breathing with our footfalls. And mindful walking is really about noticing that we are paying attention to the actual act of walking rather than where we are going. Because most of the time when we walk, we really pay attention to I'm going from here to there. And mindful walking is about the journey rather than the um, rather than the destination. So all right, let me oops this one. There we go. Okay, so mindful walking practice. If I were to, um, be in person with you today. Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, what I would have us do is I would have us get up and actually pay attention to walking. So what I want you to do when you when you are done with this video today is I'd like you to get up and become an amateur at walking again. I want you to think about you've seen we've all seen toddlers as they begin to walk and how much concentration has to go into every physical part of that for them. The lifting of the foot, the change of our balance, the swing of one foot from behind to in front of the other. What I want you to do is try to become an amateur at walking again and focus all of your attention on what it takes to get one foot in front of the other, okay? All right, and if you have questions, again, my information was at the beginning of this PowerPoint. All right, so what did you notice? Think about that as you go along. All right, and then going outside to walk adds a whole different sensory set of perceptions to walking, all right? It, it changes everything about what we do. Um, something that... Um, is becoming very common right now is forest, forest breathing, forest bathing, um, forest meditation. And that is really just connecting with the outdoor part 
of what we do, right? And the outdoor part of, of, of life. Um, there's a, a lot of research right now coming out that shows being outside in nature um, is, is very beneficial for our mental health. And so if we can be outside for 20 to 30 minutes a day, it, just as little as that, and it doesn't have to be blue sky days either. It can be gray sky days. Um, it is a boost to our mental health. It's a boost to, to our resilience to stress. Um, all right, let's see what I have here next. So what we want you to do is develop your own mindfulness foundation. And people um, are often um, feeling a little overwhelmed when we say develop your own mindfulness practice. And they say, well, I don't have time for that, or I don't know what to do. And think back to the beginning when I said, what are the moments that you really pay attention? You really notice exactly what you're doing. Those are the moments when you're being mindful, when you connect to what you're doing in that moment, when you pet your cat, when you're walking outside and you feel the sun on your face, when you are doing something and you just feel that burst of joy, that is you being mindful. That is, those are the mindful moments. And so it's about noticing those and adding more of those into our life. So if you sit in the morning with your cup of coffee and you feel the steam and you smell the smell and you taste it, and it's just this wonderful, happy moment for you, those are your mindful moments. And it can be the scent of a candle, it can be your coffee, it can be sitting with your cat, it can be reading, it can be gardening, it can be being outside in nature and feeling the sun on your face. And that's what we want you to do. And it doesn't have to be huge and time consuming. It's a couple of minutes, a couple of times a day, right? And so it's not overwhelming, or it shouldn't be overwhelming for you. It's just about really reconnecting with you. All right, so how should you practice? You should explore different practices because the ones you've got are great, but let's add some to it. Find it place, it's up to you if you're an outside person or an inside person. Uh, find a time that works for you and then practice it daily. Like I said, a couple of minutes, a couple of times a day. That's all it needs to be. All right, so think about what might work for you? That is what I have for you today. So um, if Carol or Nina have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer questions here for a few minutes. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Hey, um... I was thinking with holidays coming up and um, the New Year's and even things like the Super Bowl, there are a lot of um, festive situations with food. And uh, I know that sometimes I'm a stress eater. Does this mindfulness, does that apply to eating as well? Absolutely. Uh, we actually teach a class on mindful eating. And what we talk about is really taking it down to one bite. And so whatever, whatever it is, something that you enjoy, I usually practice it uh, in my classes with the Hershey's kiss. And so it's a one bite, really small. And taking that bite and really looking at it in the same way that we did with that object today, really noticing, looking at it, how does it look? Um, so I'll describe the Hershey kiss, right? So it's got that cute little shiny wrapper and there's lots of folds in it. And it's not all shiny because there's some shadows in there, right? And then there's that cute friendly little flag. And it reminds me, takes me back to my childhood, right? It's that just a friendly little shape, right? And then we get down close to it and we smell it. 
And how does it smell? And you can do this with anything, any bite, right? How does it smell? All right, so now we're gonna unwrap it, put it in our mouth and just break it down to one bite. How does it feel in my mouth? How does it taste in my mouth? And it really helps us to kind of reconnect to our food, really pay attention to it. And the research shows that when we do that, and it doesn't have to be every bite, trust me, that would take forever, right? But when we connect to our food and really pay attention to it, we notice things that we don't when we're eating on autopilot. And so maybe we'll, oh yeah, the richness of the cheese or the whatever it is, you might find that by connecting to it, we're, we find we're not as prone to overeating, right? Or mindlessly eating it because we're more connected to it. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Oh, okay. yeah. So I would like to share my screen for a moment here and we will just wrap up. All right, sure. Let me stop mine here really quick. So I want to thank you and remind everyone that you are a health extension educator at MSU Extension. And um, the contact information, again, will be coming out. And um, I would like to thank all of the collaborators that provide this. And there will be a whole new series starting in January. The January one will be January 17 at noon. So um, feel free to register for it. And if you have questions, you can contact the Healthy Living Together Committee through McKenzie Health System. So thank you for joining us today.